welcome to this edition of Theological Journals. The Lord be for a historiographer on story about Edmund Burke, archaeology from Oxford. Their succession from the apostles meant that the bishops inherited the apostles' authority over the church. Hobart and Bowden shared with low church members of the Episcopal Church the importance of scripture as outlined in Article 6 of the church's Articles of Religion. Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, that whatsoever is not read therein or proved thereby. Yet to the high churchmen such as Bowden and Hobart, the interpretation of Scripture by the early church was vital. Bowden said Christianity can admit of no improvements. It was complete the moment the canon of Scripture was closed. And those who lived in or near the apostolic chain, age had many advantages for understanding what were the doctrines, constitutions, and discipline of the church, which we have not. It must be stressed that Bowden, Barry, and other high churchmen were never naive enough to think that those who held the title of bishop would have the same spiritual gifts as the apostles. They stress that no one ever confounded great qualifications for an office with the office itself. Bowden expressed the difference between the wonderful qualifications of the apostles for executing their mission. Schoolmaster to the bishops. Throughout his successful teaching career, Edmund Barry would install high church principles and to some of the leading Episcopal clerics of the early 19th century. Two included Benjamin Onderdonk and George Washington Doan, who went on respectively to bishops of New York and New Jersey. Onderdonk, who would later become a Tractarian supporter, seized any opportunity he could to promote high churchmanship in the Diocese of New York. It's got three pictures here, three bishops who adopted high church theology and liturgics under the influence of Edmund Berry, George Washington Doan, Benjamin Treadwell, Onderdonk, and Jackson Kemper. He preferred the Gothic style of church, which to him seemed to give visual impression to his belief in the church having a long past reaching back to divine origins. Grace Church and Trinity Wall Street are fine, finest examples of this. Like Onderdonk, George Washington Doan was highly successful in expanding his diocese along with which meant a reshuffling of the deck, we would add, along with apostolic succession. Love work reading about these piskies. The worship of the church was its very essence. How very limited. He preached that true incorporation that the body of Christ had to be achieved through prayer and valid sacraments of the church. The high church's ultimate development into the Anglo-Catholic movement can be shown in another of Edmund Berry's pupils, Jackson Kemper. I knew one of his descendants. Kemper fully endorsed the Oxford movement that developed in the 1830s. As a missionary bishop to the West, the Beretta Belt of Anglo-Catholic Episcopal Diocese of the Midwest Owe their creation largely to him, to high churchmen like Kemper, really, in our view, a low churchman who evacuated the doctrines of grace in the New Testament and exalted themselves. The Oxford movement posed very serious questions involving historical continuity in the Episcopal Church. If an appeal was to be made to the early church for evidence of apostolic succession, 
and why were such beliefs as purgatory, celibacy, the intercession of the saints, and use of relics not also accepted? As John Newman famously, famously asked, if Athanasius and Ambrose were to come back to life today, where would they find continuity? The high church's failure to answer these questions effectively would unfortunately lead to its downfall. The rector of St. Matthew's, Jersey City. Edmund Berry took St. Matthew's, Jersey City, the city's first Episcopal church, from the upper room of the local school to the building of the church that largely survives today. A large number of his former pupils gladly helped financially at its construction. His obituary says, this parish and church tell what can be done by a good and faithful servant of Christ, diligently seeking his grace, born of principle, nurtured by faith and love, and exerted with pious earnestness, zeal, and devotion. as well as condemnation of others. St. Matthias was consecrated November 26, 1835. There was a serious fire in 1869. But the outside of the structure was largely left intact. Before it closed in 1905, the congregation of St. Matthew's had gone on to establish several other Episcopal churches in Jersey City, including Grace Church von Borst, which is still in existence. Edmund Berry died April 20, 1852. Although the church is now used by a Roman Catholic parish, its four walls and towers built under Berry's leadership. As his obituary also commented, as long as St. Matthew's Church, Jersey City stands, it will be Barry's monument, for it is substantial proof of the record of his unwearied exertions and eminent services. We turn our attention to the June edition of Table Talk. talking about Jethro in Exodus 18, 24 to 27. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Leading Israel out of Egyptian slavery was no easy feat because it required repeated appearances before an arrogant king convinced that the Israelites convincing the Israelites to heed direction and dealing with all manner of difficulties along the way. By God's grace, however, Moses was able to accomplish this. In light of such great success, despite so many obstacles, we might expect that Moses would have become haughty or that he would have been tempted to be proud and to think he had nothing to learn from anybody. If this was not the case, as Numbers 12, 3 tells us, Moses was very meek, more so than anyone else on the earth in his day. We see evidence for this in today's passage, having received advice from Jethro regarding the establishment of several judges in Israel. Moses heeded the wisdom of his father-in-law and appointed others to assist him in settling legal disputes of the nation. Other men adjudicated most of the cases, leaving Moses to decide only the most difficult cases. Though Jethro was an important man in his own clan and country, being a priest in Midian, he did not hold the exalted status of prophet and essentially king over an entire nation like Moses. 
Nevertheless, Moses recognizes true wisdom when he heard it and did not consider himself above Jethro's sage advice. John Chrysostom, an important preacher from the early church, comments, <coughs> Nothing was ever more humble than Moses, who being the leader of so great a people, and having wrought so many wonders both in Egypt and by the Red Sea and wilderness, and received such high testimony, he felt exactly as if he had been an ordinary person. The willingness of Moses to hear and follow good counsel from one with less authority provides leaders today with a good example to follow, especially leaders in the church. Surely Moses is one of the greatest leaders in the history of God's people. And if he, even if he did not think it unbecoming to recognize wisdom from those beneath him, as it were, in rank, then authorities today would be foolish not to heed wisdom from those whom they lead. John Calvin comments this yielding then of Moses to his authority lays down a rule for all the greatest and most excellent doctors that they should not refuse to receive admonitions from those whom they admit to teach rightly, although they are not of such a high dignity. Exodus 19, 1 through 9, God speaks at Sinai. Now, therefore, if you will indeed hear my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. When God first appeared to Moses in the burning bush at Mount Horeb, the Lord told Moses that the sign he was sent by our Creator would be that he and the Israelites would serve God on the same mountain. Having arrived at the wilderness of Sinai, the people would see the promised sign about to be fulfilled, as we read in today's passage. The mountain where the Israelites found themselves three months after leaving Egypt was Mount Sinai which is another name for Mount Horeb. Up until this point, God had referred to Israel as his people, but there was yet a formal covenant relationship established with them, like that which was existed with their forefather, Abraham, Genesis 15 and 17. At Mount Sinai, this would change. Upon Israel's arrival at the mountain, Moses went up to meet with the Lord, Exodus 19, 1 to 3, but probably not to its summit. There God spoke to the prophet and gave him words to deliver to the people of Israel that would begin the process of formalizing the covenant between them and the Lord. Exodus 19, 4 to 6 records what Moses was to communicate to the people. Note that God began with a brief recounting of what he had led up to the meeting with Israel at Sinai. He reminded the Israelites that they had seen the mighty works he had done in rescuing them from the Egyptians and carrying them safely through the wilderness of the mountain. God alone had done this, which means that the very foundation of his relationship with his people was divine grace. Israel had not saved itself from slavery. And the Israelites certainly had not made it so far by their own efforts. Because the Lord had acted first in grace, the Israelites were to respond in obedience to him which would result in there being a kingdom of priests and his treasured possession on the earth. God is the creator of all people, but he has not made a covenant of blessing with all people. Nevertheless, he establishes Israel as his covenant people, 
so that they will minister to the rest of the world as a holy priesthood that directs others to him, preparing to meet God. Exodus 19, 9 to 15. Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. From the beginning of God's mission to rescue the Israelites from Egypt, Moses served as the mediator between the Lord and Israel. After all, he delivered God's words to the people and stood in the place of the Lord, as it were, when they grumbled against God. Israel's encounter with the Lord at Mount Sinai, however, would make Moses' office as mediator even clearer to the people. Already, as we've seen, the Lord spoke to Moses on the mountain, and then Moses spoke to the elders of Israel to give God's call to the Israelites to be his people. And they willingly answered the Lord's summons, committing to do what he said. With this elementary foundation for the covenant being laid, God told Moses that he would be making his presence known in a tangible way at Sinai to formalize the bond between the Lord and his people. In today's passage, God delivers instructions to Moses for how the people were to prepare to encounter his presence at Sinai. What the Lord required of his people emphasizes the seriousness of the occasion. We see, for instance, that the Israelites were not allowed to ascend the mountain or even touch it once God descended in a cloud and made the place holy. Anyone who touched it, human or beast, was to be put to death by stoning or by arrow so that the people could not even touch those who had been in contact with the mountain. This meat reveals that the Lord's presence is not something to be taken lightly, that human beings can approach God casually, but rather they must respect his holiness and his transcendence as our creator. Later in Israel's history, individuals who did not respect the Lord's holiness and treated casually what he sets apart would mean death. Moses also tells the people to clean their clothes and abstain from sexual relations as they prepare to meet God. This does not mean that dirt or sex in the proper context are wrong or sinful. It means that Israel is to set itself apart from the ordinary life to avoid the temporary ritual uncleanness associated with bodily discharge. All these instructions therefore emphasize the importance of being prepared to meet with the Lord. Access to God under the new covenant, of course, does not involve so many strictures, but we still learn from today's passage that we are not to take him lightly. And we, now we have continue an article on Salt and Light by Reverend Christopher Gordon. But the principal way that believers make light in the world is through making known the good news of forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. This hope drives the Christian in this world and provides a witness to the world of the only true light shining in the darkness. Through this witness, eternal life is given to all who believe. The overall picture in Jesus' use of salt and light is clear. Christians preserve and flavor the world with their presence in how they live by doing good works, 
and they give great light to those in darkness through their witness of salvation through him in Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfills this calling and enables the New Covenant Church to accomplish this calling when believers are sincerely behaving as salt and light in this world. Christian, this is your identity. You are Jesus' salt and light. A Christian who is not salty or hides his light under a bowl is a contradiction of terms. Christians preserve the world and offer a message of hope not with false displays of external piety, but with a sincere love for those who need salvation. When Christians demonstrate the precious identity that they have been given in Jesus Christ, a great difference is made in the world, one that results in glorifying our Father who is in heaven and the salvation of people from their sins. Now for an article by Donnie Fredrickson, Prayer for the City's Welfare. The way was 597 BC and many of the BC. And many of the Jewish people had been forcibly removed from their homes in Jerusalem. They were living as exiles in Babylon. A cacophony of false prophets peddled a false hope that the exile would last only. A few years. There was widespread unrest in Babylon. There was discontent among the Jews. There was broad economic distress, growing international conflict, divisive political unrest, and a general anxiety among the people. It is not difficult to see the similarities between the Jews living in Babylon Christians living in the world today. Christians are citizens of the city of God, living in the city of man. What are they to do? What is the appropriate response of Christians living in the exile as salt and as light? How are Christians to be salt and light in the cities, areas, and regions where they live? The prophet Jeremiah took up his pen after the fall of Judah in 597 B.C. and wrote, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, To all the exiles I have sent into Babylon, from Jerusalem to Babylon. Jeremiah 29.4 God spoke to his people in the Babylonian exile to reveal his will for them. Through the word, God still speaks today. Jeremiah's instruction is a ready application for the 21st century Christians living as exiles in an increasingly post-Christian world. Jeremiah did not tell the people to run away from or rebel against Babylon. Instead, he reminded them twice that the Lord himself had sent them into exile instructed the exiles to build houses, plant gardens, take wives, have children, give their children in marriage, multiply, and not decrease. They were to make a fruitful life in Babylon. And he gave them other piece, another piece of instruction that might stri strike us as counterintuitive. Seek the welfare of the city into which I have sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find its welfare. Remember, the city here is not Jerusalem. They were to seek the welfare of Babylon to pray to the Lord on its behalf. The word welfare is the Hebrew word shalom. It is the same Hebrew word for peace, but by peace it does not mean merely the absence, merely the absence of conflict. Biblical peace includes the absence of conflict. 
It is every man living under his own vine and fig tree in a land that is at rest, Micah 4, 4. We are to seek the prosperity of the city, for in the city's prosperity we will experience prosperity. Jeremiah then added that the manner in which to seek the welfare of the city is by praying for the city. Prosperity for the city will come through prayer. This does not mean that we don't do anything else, but it does mean that the bare minimum is that we pray. How should we pray for the city? David's instruction in Psalm 12 or 122, 6 to 9, is a prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. These principles are transferable to our prayers for the welfare of another city. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. We're called to seek the welfare of the city by praying for the economy, safety, leadership, and the people of the city. We pray for financial prosperity of the people, that they would be economically secure. We pray for the defense of those in the city, that they would be safe. We pray for those who govern from the towers, that their leadership would be effective in achieving good things. We pray for all people that they would experience peace within. Praying for the welfare of the city is praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask for the welfare of the city, which comes only when people have have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, written by Reverend Donnie Fredrickson, Senior Pastor of Lakeside Presbyterian Church in South Lake, Texas. A nice article. And we pick up a book review. The book is Protecting Your Church Against Sexual Predators, Legal Frequently Asked Questions for Church Leaders by Voyle Glover of Kriegel Publications, 2005, 133 pages, reviewed by Kareth, nuclear pastor's wife and mother in Randolph, Wisconsin. This is in the Standard Bearer. I first heard the name of Megan Conka while reading Protecting Your Church Against Sexual Predators by Voyle Glover. Before you read any further, if you are able, I pull, I ask you to pull up out your computer and phone and search the name. Do you see her? You see her squinted eyes peering out at you. Eyes that seem ready to let loose laughter at any moment. Her tan cheeks gather upward in a smile. Her button nose sits so beautifully. The teeth of hers remind me so much of my own daughter. The two metal pearls beam prominently and proudly. Clear evidence of a baby just growing to be a child. Her hair wisps its way into the photo, breathing childhood at me. But this little girl would not live to see the start of the second grade. When Megan went missing, police discovered that her neighbor had lured her into his home with the promise to show her a puppy. Once inside, he raped Megan, then strangled her to death as she fought off the attack. Following the brutal assault, her precious body was stuffed in a toy chest and driven to a county park where the assailant sexually assaulted her a final time before disposing her body in the weeds. When the neighbor finally confessed to police, he told them he had been watching Megan for months 
information regarding Megan's rape and murder was accessed from the following website www.bullbap.com slash you slash Megan Conco and Justice Changed All. You may be asking, what's the point in bringing this up? While trying to spare the heinous details, yet at the same time seeking to comprehend the horrific realities a scared seven-year-old girl went through, I bring this to your attention because her parents did not know. They were completely unaware that their neighbor had two previous convictions of sexual assault. This violent rape and murder brought forth Megan's Law, which orders local officials to make public in whatever way their state judges the names of known sexual offenders. So it's really simple. I do not want our families to be the ones weeping, saying to themselves, if we had only known. Protecting your church against sexual predators, that's the name of the volume, by, again, Voile Glover, is written from a legal perspective, setting the author up to give leaders guidance on defending their churches from the horrors of abuse. His aim is not to provoke irrational fear, but rather to promote a more watchful attitude. He calls attention, calls us to acknowledge that sexual abuse dwells in our midst, and to appreciate the danger it poses. Churches are often filled with children and lack proper monitoring, and therefore are targets of abuse. Along with this, we have a tendency to want to see the best in people, and perhaps are even inclined to minimize or cover a crime by saying to ourselves, but for the grace of God go I. Although molestation can occur anywhere, the book lists some of the more common areas where it occurs, including nursery, special outings, Sunday school, sleepovers, counseling, and bathrooms. Grover takes a firm stance prohibiting males to help in a nursery. Glover's approach is to create an environment in the church that is decidedly hostile to sexual predators. He emphasizes the growing awareness we must have <clears throat> that church leaders must take strides to assure their congregants are serious about protecting the sheep. The process begins where the pastor and other leaders realize that they themselves are not above suspicion. Every pastor ought to want to demonstrate to the congregation he is willing to place his ministry in the open. He makes clear that precautions and policies must be made and implemented, spelling out distinctly for the congregation what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Two precautions he gives are avoiding single teacher environments in Sunday school classes and forbidding a man to counsel a woman alone. Strikingly, sexual sin involving pastors occurs more in counseling than in any other setting. Glover advises pastors involve their wives and or another mature woman in counseling situation to provide protection as well as a feminine touch that Titus 2, 3 through 5 encourages. He bluntly states, I believe it is often pride that prompts a pastor to believe he can counsel alone, where he realizes that some may be critical of leaders taking a hard stance on these issues. He warns not to waver in your precautions, that as people become accustomed to the good reasons why everyone should be held to a high standard, there will be new evidence in the church as a safe place with prudent leaders. 
Regarding offenders, Glover admits that where data indicates pedophiles are wired differently in their psychosexual makeup, and therefore it is generally believed that they do not change, that research does not consider God's ability to change the heart. However, reality remains that even if change is present, we cannot know the heart of man. Consequently, even with confession, the church must not place unrestrained, implicit trust in the individual. He states to ignore the strength of pedophilia addiction, even in changed pedophiles, is to court danger. Wonderful article. And we'll bring this segment to a close and pick up a little later. Godspeed.